And a lot of non-sedative contests try to cite this principle, the first C cannot be judged, to contradict the teaching that we are citing about recognizing a claimant as a manifest heretic without a declaration. The two are not in opposition at all. In fact, Pope Paul IV in his bull, Cum Ex Apostolatus, where he says you cannot recognize a heretic as a pope, he cites this teaching that the pope cannot be judged. The two aren't in opposition, because when you recognize someone like Benedict XVI to be a manifest heretic, you are not judging a pope. You are recognizing a non-Catholic to be outside the church. By his manifestation of heresy and apostasy, he has proven himself not to be a pope, but to be a non-Christian, a non-Catholic. And therefore, you're not evaluating a pope at all, actually. You're simply recognizing a non-Catholic for what he is. In the description for this video, there's a link to a new article we just published. It's an interesting and important article because it refutes a certain non sedivic contest named John Salza. It goes through and exposes every single page of an article that Salza wrote in response to our refutation of him, and it proves that there's a lie, an error, or a shocking contradiction on every single page. And so we strongly encourage anyone who is interested in these issues to read the article. It proves that he completely changed his position in his second article on whether a Catholic can determine another person to be a heretic without a declaration. And while the article goes through all the details, I want to focus on a few of the highlights and main points. And the first one concerns the principle that the first C cannot be judged. Because this individual named John Salza, and this is a guy who refused my challenge to debate him and lied about it. We have a video exposing his astounding lies. It makes public our email exchanges, etc. In his first article attacking the state of a contest position, he made the argument that you cannot recognize someone to be a heretic until there's a declaration from the church. And we published an article called John Sauls' Arguments Against State of a Contism Crushed, which completely refuted his position and showed how he contradicted himself numerous times. The church does not teach that you cannot recognize another, quote, Catholic as a heretic until there's a declaration. And so his argument was demolished. For his second article, he changed his position after it was refuted. In his second article, he argues that he never even said that. He says you can recognize people as heretics without a declaration, but not in the case of a, quote, pope. He argues that in the case of a, quote, pope, it's so important that the common good requires a declaration. How convenient. But the problem with this argument is not only does it contradict his previous article and prove that he's a liar again, but his new position that you can recognize some people as heretics without a declaration but not a pope creates even more problems for him. And that's because of the principle that the first C cannot be judged. Saul's second article, and this is the principal heresy in it, argues that you must have a judgment that the pope is a heretic and that follows a canonical trial of the Pope. Let me give you a quick example. On page 7 of his article, he says that the Pope would still be entitled to rebut the presumption of heresy in a canonical trial. All right. So he's saying that the Pope could be subjected to a canonical trial. We need to look to an infallible council. In, in that case, the council would have authority over the Pope in order to judge him whether he's to be deposed or whether he's to be vindicated. And then after they've made the decision and after they put forth a, a legitimate pope and the smoke clears, the legitimate pope can then declare that council to be infallible. He says this so many times in his article, it's stunning. Why is this important? Because it's completely wrong. The Code of Canon Law, Canon 1556, specifically says on trials that the first C cannot be judged. And this principle is actually a principle of the divine law flowing directly from the primacy given to St. Peter. The Pope cannot be subjected to a trial. The Pope cannot be subjected to an examination. The Pope cannot be declared against by lower clergy because he has no superior. The first seat cannot be judged. That's why Pope St. Nicholas, going back to 865, says, Neither by Augustus nor by all the clergy nor by religious will the judge be judged. The first seat will not be judged by anyone. End quote. 
So Salza, pretending like he understands what he's talking about, actually displays that he has no idea what he's talking about by arguing repeatedly that the Pope would have to be tried canonically and then declared to be a heretic. He says it on page 7, he says it on page 6, he says it on page 10, three different times. He says it on page 15, 18, 20, etc. And I expose all of this in my article, and it really shows whose position is false. It's his. If you ever violate uh, the secrets of Masonry. So they set the tone right away, that this is a secret organization, it's a secret ritual, you can never reveal it. Hmm. Then they escort you into the lodge, and the worshipful master, who is the head principal officer of the lodge, asks you to make a confession of faith in deity. This is the only requirement for you to be a Mason. A man must believe in God, must make a profession of faith in deity. doesn't matter what God he believes in. And so uh, the worshipful master puts his left hand on the candidate's head and says, in whom do you put your trust? This is the first test. If you're an atheist, you can't be a Mason. If you make any profession of faith in deity, you're worthy. And so I, of course, professed my belief in Jesus Christ, but if I would have made a profession, let's say, in the Great Thumb, or in Brahma, or Vishnu, or Hiva, whatever it is, the Lodge would have told me, and I quote, your trust being in God, your faith is well founded. Arise, follow your conductor, and fear no danger. So here's Janet, where the Lodge, if this man rejects Jesus Christ and the Holy Trinity, Freemasonry lies to that man. It tells that man that he's still okay, his trust is in God, and his faith is well founded.
And let's consider an example to illustrate the full scope of his schismatic error. Suppose you have a claimant to the papacy who is suspected of heresy. According to Salza, there would have to be a trial of the Pope, and the Pope would be given the opportunity, quote, to rebut the presumption of heresy in a canonical trial. Now, suppose that during the trial, the Pope issues a decree to the Church stating that he's innocent, but the trial finds the Pope guilty. According to Salza's argument, Catholics would have to go with the authoritative decree of the trial and whoever conducted it, the bishops, the cardinals, whoever, and reject the authoritative decree of the Pope. His heretical position is therefore teaching that Catholics can reject the judgments of the Apostolic See, and that is condemned in Vatican I, which declared that the judgments of the Apostolic See are not to be disclaimed by anyone. All of this points us directly back to the true position which is that heretics lose their offices without declaration, and that a claimant to the papacy who demonstrates manifest heresy, one, loses his office without declaration, and two, the loss of office must be able to be recognized without any declaration, since no one could make the declaration against a pope. And that's precisely why saints and doctors of the church and Pope Paul IV teach that you could reject a heretical claimant to the papacy as a non-pope, if it's manifest and clear, without any declaration, because no one could give the declaration anyway. And Saul's heretical position also means that a pope can be de facto deposed, because if you must accept a guy as the pope until there's a declaration of heresy against him, then it is that declaration which is transferring your obedience from the reigning pope away from the reigning pope. And therefore, that declaration is serving de facto, in fact, as the deposition of the Roman pontiff. It is the event, the decree, that swings your obedience away from the Roman pontiff. And that's heretical because the Pope cannot be deposed by anyone. He can only be deposed by the divine law for heresy. And that's why St. Robert Bellarmine says that he would lose his office without declaration. And even if one wants to argue that the decree or the declaration against the, quote, Pope is not deposing him, but only authoritatively recognizing a deposition that automatically occurred for heresy, it still doesn't work. Because the fact is that in that scenario, you are regarding him as the Pope until the declaration. And therefore, it is the declaration that, in fact, transfers your obedience away from him and serves as the deposition. And that's why a decree could only be rendered against someone who has already been recognized without any declaration to be a non-pope by virtue of his heresy. And since it can be recognized without a decree, anyone could recognize it. It doesn't have to be a particular clergyman. And so this is the principal heresy in Saul's new article. He thinks he has a response and he only falls into a deeper pit and demonstrates that he doesn't understand what he's talking about at all. And that's what this article that I published shows. And it's important for those who want to see the truth on this matter to read it. And the fact is that we're living in a situation where it's obvious to any honest person whose position is true. We can refute all of his arguments, as I'm showing right now. But it's a matter of who wants to accept the truth. And I bring this up in reference to this individual, not because he's overly significant, but because in refuting what he puts forward, it refutes them all. All of them actually make variations of this kind of argument. We're at the point now where the heresies of Benedict XVI are so overwhelming and undeniable that they don't even try to address them. They can't address them, as you can see from our debates. They just ignore them. So their primary argument is that, well, we can't judge. We need a declaration. We need a council. There was another individual on YouTube whose username begins with September, he was making the argument, well, a council would have to settle the matter. Completely wrong. That's the heresy of conciliarism. A council cannot depose a pope. A council cannot call a pope to a trial. A council cannot officially judge a pope. All right, a council can't do it. The cardinals can't do it. No one can do it. It happens automatically. All right, and that's why it happens without declaration. Not only the loss of office, but also the ability Catholics have to recognize it. And I finally uh, be accepted my Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and I had Him burning in my heart, and I was only able to do that when I read the Scripture. 
an Argentine cardinal who was almost elected pope, celebrated Hanukkah in a Jewish temple in the presence of leaders of other religions. A family photo rarely seen. Rabbis, Catholic priests, and Afro-Brazilian religious leaders standing side by side in a Jewish temple celebrating Hanukkah. Together they prayed for religious freedom and tolerance in the world. Some chanting in Hebrew, others in silence, all asking for peace in their own words. The guest of honor of this interreligious ceremony was none other than Cardinal Jose Maria Bergoglio. The Archbishop of Buenos Aires was the second most voted candidate to succeed Pope John Paul II in 2005. And God said, let there be light. He spoke about the holy light shining on all mankind alike and lit a candle. December is a specially festive month in Buenos Aires as Argentina's Christians and Jews celebrate both Christmas and Hanukkah. If you make any profession of faith in deity, you're worthy. And so I, of course, professed my belief in Jesus Christ, but if I would have made a profession, let's say, in the Great Thumb or in Brahma or Vishnu or Heba, whatever it is, the Lodge would have told me, and I quote, your trust being in God, your faith is well-founded. Arise, follow your conductor, and fear no danger. So here's Janet, where the Lodge, if this man rejects Jesus Christ and the Holy Trinity, Freemasonry lies to that man. It tells that man that he's still okay, his trust is in God, and his faith is well-founded. So that's really a key principle, and while we've made the point in the past about the first seat cannot be judged and how it relates to this issue, it really struck me in a new way how important this principle is in refuting this particular heretic Salza, because it's just staggering how clearly he contradicts this position, and I just want to give one or two more examples to illustrate how precisely he contradicts Catholic teaching on this matter. For example, on page 10 he says, These decrees of excommunication are necessary when talking about the occupant of the papal throne. End quote. Completely wrong. He's saying that decrees of excommunication can be leveled against the occupant of the papal throne. Therefore, the occupant of the papal office can be declared against and judged. Here's another example. This is from page 21 of his heretical article. He says that then the elected pope would be subject to the ecclesiastical procedures that Diamond says don't apply. Investigations, trials, declaratory sentences, end quote. He explicitly says that a pope would be subject to trials, investigations, declaratory sentences. Catholic teaching is exactly the opposite. On trials, Code of Canon Law, the first seat is judged by no one. And I quoted Pope St. Nicholas. I could give other quotes. And so it shows you how deceptive these guys are. They pretend like they understand what they're talking about. He doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. None. He's completely wrong. And this article, it's simply astounding, the contradictions this guy exhibits. I wrote over 50 pages exposing his contradictions, and I break it down sectionally. He contradicts himself so many times, it's truly amazing. I proved that there are contradictions within his first piece, within his second piece, contradictions between his first piece and his second piece. I just quoted how he's saying you must have a trial and a declaration against a pope to determine if he's a heretic. Well, he also contradicts that many times in his article. He admits that if anti-pope John Paul II did certain things and said certain things, then it would be so obvious that he's a heretic without any declaration. Yet he spent pages arguing that you need a declaration. So he abandons that again. And so I wanted to emphasize that point on judging the Holy See because it was interesting how in his first piece he put forward the heresy that you cannot recognize anyone as a heretic without a declaration. That was demolished. So he changed that up, lied about ever having taught it, 
And he said, well, I'm not saying you can't recognize someone as a heretic until there's a declaration. But in the case of a papal claimant, how convenient, you need a declaration. But he only falls into a deeper pit and directly contradicts the Catholic teaching on judging the first see. And a lot of non civicantists try to cite this principle, the first see cannot be judged, to contradict the teaching that we are citing about recognizing a claimant as a manifest heretic without a declaration. The two are not in opposition at all. In fact, Pope Paul IV in his bull, Cum Ex Apostolatus, where he says you cannot recognize a heretic as a pope, he cites this teaching that the pope cannot be judged. The two aren't in opposition. Because when you recognize someone like Benedict XVI to be a manifest heretic, you are not judging a pope. You are recognizing a non-Catholic to be outside the church. By his manifestation of heresy and apostasy, he has proven himself not to be a pope, but to be a non-Christian, a non-Catholic. And therefore, you're not evaluating a pope at all, actually. You're simply recognizing a non-Catholic for what he is. So that's the first main principle that's discussed in this article, this careful refutation of Salza. The second principle I want to mention quickly, and there are a lot of things covered in the article, so we hope people read it, I'm not going to cover them all, is this principle about the lapsi. In the early church, the lapsi, or the lapsed, were those who apostatized during periods of persecution. They feared death or extreme physical torture, and for that reason they sacrificed to the false gods, or had a document drawn up attesting that they had sacrificed to the false gods. Since they truly feared death and horrible torture, were those individuals excused from the sin and crime of apostasy? No, they weren't. That proves that you cannot deny the faith for any reason, even if you fear torture, even if you're under pressure, etc. It doesn't justify apostasy. And it also exemplifies the principle that if people commit apostasy in the external forum or heresy, they are considered guilty. Now, this guy Salza actually attempts to justify the heresies and apostasy of the Vatican II antipopes based on their, quote, desire to please the world. And he advances this as a possible defense to their guilt. This is Antichrist. And it's totally refuted by this example of the lapsi. He's saying that because Benedict XVI fears the world, he might not have a direct desire to deny Catholic teaching, and therefore he could be excused for teaching his heresies. It doesn't make any difference if he fears the world. The lapsi feared death and torture. They were still apostates. If you commit acts that are intrinsically evil or that involve a denial of the faith, it doesn't matter if you have fear. If you go through with the act yourself, he gives the heretical speeches, and of course, it's a fact that he is giving them freely. He gives them with great joy. He participates in false ecumenism, non-Catholic worship, trips to the synagogue with a smile on his face, in complete freedom. And so there's no evidence that he's even under threats at all. But even if he were, he would still be guilty for his heresies and apostasy. Thus, this fact destroys Saul's argument that the antipopes might be excused on the basis that they, quote, desire to please the world. And in this article, I give an example of if this guy Salza had lived during the lapsi controversy. And in the early church, that's one thing I didn't mention, the lapsi were considered apostates, and the penitential discipline for much of the second century was that they weren't to be reconciled even after they repented. That's how serious their sin was considered to be. Eventually, the church decided that they can be reconciled after a period of public penance for their apostasy, but in many places, the penitential discipline was that they were only perhaps to be admitted in danger of death. This is after they confessed and the persecution ended. It just shows you how these individuals, Salza and others, in attempting to defend the Vatican II apostates, are putting forward the defense of Christ's denial. They're trying to justify the denial of Catholic dogma, the denial of Jesus Christ. And so that's just another example which blows another one of their false arguments out of the water. And so in this article that's linked up, you can see that the amount of errors this guy puts forward, it's truly staggering. He argues that Benedict XVI doesn't believe in what he says. That's absurd. There's no evidence of that. He's given thousands of speeches. Moreover, even if he didn't believe in what he says, he would still be guilty. 
the Lapsi didn't believe in the false gods they worshipped. They worshipped the false gods out of fear. They were still apostate. And the fact that he's arguing that Benedict XVI doesn't believe in what he says illustrates he has no response for his heresies. He contradicts himself so many times on whether you need a declaration against a claimant to consider him a heretic. It's just truly vomit from the pit of hell. He argues that none of the novelties and new doctrines are taught magisterially by the antipopes. Completely destroyed. I prove from Benedict XVI's book, Light of the World, that Benedict XVI teaches the Orthodox are part of the Church, and he says that's the binding teaching of Vatican II. Therefore, it's the magisterial teaching of Vatican II and Saul's sect and the sect of those who accept him. Completely wrong. And in fact, I cite this guy's own material in which he puts forward this heresy that Catholics must believe the Orthodox are part of the Church. And so that's what we're dealing with here. And it's quite revealing, this article, the amount of lies and errors. And I think it's akin to Freemasonry because what became clear to me in analyzing this article is just like when people enter Freemasonry, they commit grave sin. But many of them don't realize that the end of Freemasonry, the end of the road, is Lucifer. They ultimately worship Lucifer. In the same way, the people who are putting up all of these defenses for Benedict XVI, trying to justify this guy who praises schismatics, praises paganism, partakes in non-Catholic worship, goes to synagogues. They're trying to put up all this stuff to cover over this dark reality. But when you pick it apart and you analyze it, you see, nope, error, nope, error, nope, error. And then they switch up their positions, more error, schism, judging the Holy See. There's nowhere they can go because their position is false. And when you pull off the mask and uncover it all and analyze it, the end result is Lucifer. That's what they're defending. And so that's what this article shows, and we encourage people to read it. So check out our website, VaticanCatholic.com. This what occurs to me as you're sharing here, John, that what we have here is um, syncretism. What we have here is an indifferentism. It doesn't matter which God you believe in as long as you believe in a God. And so therefore, any path of religious expression is the same as any other path. There is no one right way to go. All paths are equal, and they all lead to whatever this god of Freemasonry who maybe uh, encompasses all of these mm -hmm. gods is all about. Am I right or am You're I reading too much? Right. The, the grand architect of the universe is what Masonry calls God. They give their own unique names for their understanding of God and their own symbols for God. Why do they do that? Because they want to identify their understanding of God as unique. I mean, when you name something in the world, you're declaring that something unique. And indifferentism that you mentioned really is the primary basis upon which the church has condemned Freemasonry.